Hi, welcome to the Ortho Biologics Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Trevor Turner, RMSK. We are here to talk about what is a buyer's guide to stem cell therapy. This particular episode is brought to you by the Center for Regenerative Orthopedics at georgiabonejoint.org. We're very pleased today to host on our show for the first time an interview with Dr. Jason Marchetti. Dr. Marchetti is a board-certified PM&R or physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist. He works in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. You can check out his business online at madoma.com, which is Madoma Wellness. Uh, so, without further ado, we're going to talk about Jason's new book, which was written to help deliver this mission of helping patients choose how they find somebody who is capable of doing their procedures well and who is ethical and supported by the evidence. So with that said, Jason, take it away. Yeah. So I wrote, uh, I wrote this book a couple of years ago. Uh, it's called a buyer's guide to stem cell therapy. And then the subtitle is, uh, you know, safely choose, uh, the right regenerative procedure for you. And, um, really I wanted to provide information to people that, uh, you know, didn't just talk about, you know, what, what is the, what is the state of the science in 2017? Because obviously, you know, the, the science changes rapidly. It's always, you know, new studies coming out every month, uh, certainly every year. And um, I wanted to really give them tools to be able to scrutinize the science and also understand what's going on out there in uh, what we call the world of stem cells, because there's a lot of misinformation there's a lot of confusing advertising, and frankly, there's some uh, people who are, are just uh, fraudulently advertising in some cases where they're misrepresenting what they're doing and calling it a stem cell procedure, uh, oftentimes overcharging as well. So, um, you know, again, the purpose of it was to, to really give patients, not to, this isn't a book for doctors by any means, but a book for patients who are interested in these procedures to understand the background of what stem cells are, um, why they're not covered by insurance in most cases, what the FDA has to say about uh, uh, stem cells, and then um, not just talk about stem cells, but really just regenerative treatments overall, because not everything has to be treated with stem cells in order to get better. And, and in fact, in my practice, I've had a lot of luck with uh, just what's called prolotherapy, which uh, doesn't involve any cells at all. So that's that's a great introduction, Jason. And you know, when we speak about orthobiologics, I mean, that field really includes a lot of things. And we, you know, of course, beyond stem cell, we talk about PRP, we talk about visco supplement, and now prolotherapy. And we we actually haven't had an episode yet on the show about prolotherapy. So can you can you give us a brief kind of definition or a, a idea of what that entails? Sure. So prolotherapy just stands for pro proliferative therapy. So the purpose of that treatment is to try to, um, you know, have our immune cells, our, the, the cells that are involved in the reparative process uh, activated. And um, traditionally, it, I mean, it's been around for decades. Um, and, you know, many decades ago, there were uh, kind of the, the, the fathers of prolotherapy who, uh, you know, they tried different concoctions uh, in their injections to see which ones seem to, to have the best effect as well as um, being the least uh, kind of inflammatory or painful for patients. And the substance that seemed to kind of help accomplish both things was dextrose. And so you'll hear uh, the term dextrose prolotherapy, which is really a, a form of sugar. And you use that sugar in a hypertonic solution. Um, and inject what's, hy what's hypertonic? So hypertonic just means it's it's concentrated, and so it actually attracts water. Right. Uh, and so when you inject it around the, uh, you know, for instance, ligaments or tendon insertions, um, it it, uh, it attracts you know water out of those tissues. It causes inflammation, and that causes our cells to uh, really release their uh, all of the factors that they release at the time of injury to try to recruit immune cells to that area to try to try to heal it. So that's a great segue too, because I think, you know, a lot of people hear the term inflammation and they think, well, inflammation is bad. That's what hurting me. So can you, can you elaborate on that? Yeah. And there's, you know, the immune system is very complicated with, uh, you know, hundreds, if not more uh, of chemicals that, that are involved in signaling. So all of these chemicals are released in order to tell other cells, Hey, there's a problem. I need you to come and, and fix it, so to speak. Um, and, 
traditionally, when you look at the treatments that we've had uh, for many years that are tried and true and accepted, well, I guess I can't, I can't say they're tried and true, but they've certainly been around a long time, like steroid injections. Um, those are ones that we use to try to block inflammation. And so we know that those injections will help with calming down inflammation, calming down pain pretty quickly, but they don't actually help with healing. Um, and in fact, we know that, that they probably impair healing because they actually block those signaling processes. And there's been more recent research out over probably the past five or six years that has also shown that those medications and, and even anesthetics like Marcaine um, actually kill off some of the cells that we are trying to preserve, like the chondrocytes in, in our, our cartilage. And so when we talk about regenerative medicine and prolotherapy, uh, we're really looking at a paradigm sh paradigm shift where we want to go away from these treatments that are destructive um, and could potentially be causing long-term um, uh, setbacks, you know, causing arthritis. And, uh, you know, we know that they thin the ligaments, thin the cartilage, really trying to move away from those and move to treatments that do the opposite and hopefully uh, will assist in rebuilding those tissues and, and actually improving healing. That's great. So it sounds like when you talk about the context of orthobiologics and, and, and that sounds like prolotherapy and PRP or even stem cell if required, you're really focusing on a long-term type of an outcome, not just a, you know, let's get a shot and help you have a good weekend, but on a how do you become the most functional over a longer period of time. Exactly. And that's, uh, you know, when you look at studies that uh, look at like bone marrow, aspirate, concentrate, what we call uh, mesen mesenchymal stem cells, for instance, um, you know, the few studies that are out there with those treatments, um, one trend that you see is that, you know, people who come in with, you know, end stage disease, severe bone on bone arthritis, you know, they don't do as well as people who have less severe disease, uh, at least in the publications. And conceptually, that makes sense because, you know, again, those, those cells that we're putting in, in the joint or around the ligament, whatever you're treating, their job is to try to boost the immune response and boost the healing response. And if you don't have cells already there, like chondrocytes in your cartilage, then there's nothing really to, to activate. There's no workers, if you will, to get to work. Um, and so unfortunately we're, we're in this situation where a lot of our patients, you know, they'll show up when they have really bad disease and, you know, they're trying to avoid a knee replacement or whatever surgery they're trying to avoid. And they come in asking about stem cells, hoping that, you know, their knee will become 18 again. And the reality is, is um, that doesn't happen. And, uh, and those are patients that, uh, you know, when they come to me, I counsel them and say, uh, you know, I, there's certainly not literature support that says that that will predictably get better. We're not going to make your knee 18 again. What might happen is we can hopefully modulate the inflammation. We can try to mitigate the process of the arthritis that's going on in order to help you have less pain and have increased function for a certain period of time. Um, and in general, when you look at uh, like bone marrow treatments, if you get benefit for a year or two, that's that's pretty good. Uh, similarly, with with uh, platelet rich plasma, if you get some clinical benefit for a year, that's pretty good. Uh, but there are treatments that will have to be repeated over time. It's not just something where you do an injection and, you know, again, the knee is new again and, and uh, they're going to be good for decades. Uh, we know we're not there yet. Um, and and Unfortunately, you know, again, part of the reason I wrote the book is if you go online to different people's websites, uh, you know, they have kind of these videos that make it look like the knee becomes new again and the cartilage regrows. Um, and there's still this, uh, this concept propagated that, you know, by transplanting stem cells, for instance, from your bone marrow to your joint, that that stem cell is going to become a chondrocyte and you're going to replenish chondrocytes in your knee. Whereas we, we, see that that probably isn't the case, that um, instead of these stem cells becoming new cells, they actually help uh, really in a signaling process to try to, again, get that immune response uh, in a more uh, anabolic state, meaning uh, one where it's not destroying the joint anymore, but trying to preserve it. 
Yeah, I think that is a really good summary because I spend a huge amount of time with my patients just on education. And, and a lot of what we talk about is the soup. So we talk about using you know, biologics, whether it's PRP or, or BMAC, which is bone marrow derived you know, stem cell or, or, or even prolo about you know, what we may not be making your knee look like you're 18 again, like you said, but if we can change the components or the, or the things that sit inside that soup, that inside the joint, that can really make people a lot more functional. And so I really appreciate you relating that. Jason, let me ask you another question. I get a lot of patients who come into the clinic and, and they want to know about you know, FDA compliance and FDA approval and when are things going to be covered by insurance. How do you address some of those issues? Well, um, you know, right now the FDA has, has basically said, um, you know, we know there's a lot of clinics out there that are advertising um, or mis misrepresenting in their advertising. Um, and here's, here's what we expect from you. And um, uh, a few years ago, they basically said, we're going to give you until November 2020 um, to become in compliance. Now, I've also gotten some emails from some different companies that have said, hey, uh, you know, the FDA is now signaling and some of the things that they're uh, they're publishing and statements that they're making that uh, they're not really pleased about, um, uh, you know, the response of clinics uh, in trying to become more compliant. They're not seeing much change happening. And uh, so they might do some selective um, enforcement, if you will, before November 2020. Um, and so now there's companies that are basically advertising to say, hey, um, bring us in as a consultant and, and we'll uh, help you become compliant, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So it, it is something that over the next year, I, I think it's, it's going to, uh, you know, hopefully uh, be something that's more enforced by the FDA as far as making sure that uh, uh, the people who are offering regenerative treatments aren't you know, doing things like um, using amniotic tissue that has no living cells in it and calling it a stem cell procedure and charging patients thousands and thousands of dollars for it. Not that those products are bad, um, but as, as you'll read in, in the uh, relevant chapters in my book, um, those products, uh, you know, they have growth factors, they help modulate uh, inflammatory mediators. Um, so they have likely some clinical benefit, but uh, that's certainly not, there's certainly not a lot of literature to support them. Uh, but at the same time, let's call it what it is. You know, those are, those are uh, tissues from other people who, um, you know, donated their uh, placenta, their uh, amniotic membrane, their uh, umbilical tissue at the time of C-section. It then gets processed as a uh, tissue for donation and uh, companies will put them into membrane uh, sheets that uh, some of the surgeons will use, for instance, to wrap around tendons or nerves to reduce uh, scar tissue. Um, and then there's other pr uh, products where they'll actually ground it up almost to like a powder. Uh, but again, there's nothing living in those tissues. Um, and so to call them stem cells is, is not accurate, obviously. Um, some of those products also are frozen. And so they'll actually take like umbilical tissue, freeze it. Uh, but again, it, you know, there might be some stem cells in it, but it is not a, you know, purified stem cell product by any means. You can't even be sure that there are any stem cells. And then there's some other groups who have taken those products and, um, you know, tried to actually grow cells from it and have found that they didn't really get a whole lot to grow. So, um, obviously, it's a field that we really need to have better regulation, and I think the FDA will eventually get there, um, and, and it is something that will uh, hopefully evolve over the next couple of years. Let's certainly hope so. So, Jason, you, you have a, a lot of knowledge, obviously, about what different products are out there on the market and, and what things are appropriate to offer patients based upon what pathology they come in with. Go ahead and, if you will, I know you, you, your book lays this out very nicely and you have a table of contents with headings for people that want to focus on a specific topic, but go ahead and tell me you know, more about kind of what you offer patients and, and how do patients know when they come in to see you? I mean, other, other than the fact that you're an MD and, and you wrote a book, I mean, how do they know that the quality is going to be high? What are the things they should look for in a physician who, who's best qualified to offer them this type of therapy? 
Well, you know, I think that the the first sniff test that I I would recommend to people is really, um, you know, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. You know, if you're going to a place that, um, you know, they're they're advertising that they can cure autism and uh, you know, things like that with, uh, stem cell procedures and injections and that, um, you know, oh, just a couple of treatments and you'll be, you know, you'll be 18 again. Uh, you know, we know from the literature that that isn't true. So if you're, if you're hearing those types of statements, I would start asking a lot of questions. The first question I would ask is, well, what's, what stem cells are you using? Um, and if they're talking about an off the shelf product, I would ask, what is the name of that product? And then research it. Is it something that, um, again, even has any living cells in it at all? Um, and are they advertising that as a stem cell? The other recommendation that I have, at least that's my my personal opinion, is um, you know there's not a one size fit all type of regimen. In other words, not all problems need to have you know bone marrow concentrate. Uh, there's some procedures that do well, or uh, some conditions that do well with PRP with prolotherapy, and there's some where amniotic tissue or umbilical tissue is reasonable to consider as well. Um, but if you see a practitioner who offers all of those, then you know you're going to get a, maybe a bit more of a thoughtful answer uh, to your problem. Sure, and talk with me about image guidance a little bit, if you would, Jason. Well, um, you know, there, there's certainly a push to, um, you, you know, use appropriate image guidance, whether it's fluoroscopy, which is x-ray guidance, uh, or ultrasound guidance is the other one that's becoming more and more popular because you can uh, do it relatively easily in the office. Uh, but obviously, if, uh, if a patient's going to spend thousands of dollars on a stem cell procedure, uh, you want to make sure it got into the right place, that you didn't just, you know, stick it in the knee and hope it got to where you needed it to go. Um, and so again, you want to see if there's, uh, if your practitioner uh, is using image guidance, um, you know, again, it doesn't have to be used all the time in every condition, but, you know, again, if you're going to be, uh, treating a specific, uh, um, injury or a specific area, uh, you want to make sure that that needle tip is getting to the right place and that, uh, you're working with a practitioner who is skilled in doing that. Absolutely. Well, tell us more about some of the features in your book that you think are really important to give people the the crux of your message. Sure. So I think, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, there's a chapter in my book on, on a primer on scientific literature. Um, and so it kind of talks about the different levels of evidence. And, uh, and it says, don't get suckered by testimonials, because you'll you'll see that a lot. And not that testimonials are necessarily bad, but if you're really basing your decision to have a procedure on, you know, what somebody else did, you know, I had a friend who had this in his knee, he did great, I want it too. Um, that's not really a scientific way to figure out what is what is a good treatment. Um, and again, on websites, you'll see a lot of testimonials um, because they, you know, they have emotional impact. People make a connection with that person as opposed to seeing data. Um, but it, if you're going to even consider spending thousands of dollars on a procedure, um, I go through a methodology of um, you know going to PubMed, which is the uh, uh, repository for scientific articles that's maintained by the federal government, um, and you can search for your condition, what kind of treatments you're looking for or, or considering, to see what kind of uh, literature is there out there that supports, uh, you know, whatever sort of treatment that you're looking for, the condition that you have, because frankly, one of the other things we need to be really cognizant of is, is um, uh, you know, what is the literature support for the, um, you know, the standard of care, if you will. So, for instance, um, you know, whether it's arthritis or different uh, ligaments or tendon injuries, um, you know, without regenerative treatments, those things were commonly treated with physical therapy, with medications, steroid injections, and then different surgeries. So um, there are some conditions where those treatments work pretty darn well. And those are probably sandboxes that we as regenerative practitioners don't need to be, you know, really uh, pushing people to have stem cell procedures because, um, you know, again, if they can get better with, uh, with something that is covered by their insurance, that is a safe alternative um, then that should be part of the education process for them. But we as regenerative uh, orthopedic practitioners, 
we should really be focusing on conditions where there isn't great alternatives, where maybe the surgical procedures aren't, uh, you know, they don't have high level evidence either, that type of thing. Or uh, again, if, if patients are relying on destructive treatments like uh, anti-inflammatories and steroid injections, uh, then educating them how those can have long-term detrimental effects and why we might want to think about, you know, at least something like prolotherapy uh, to avoid that destruction or PRP, uh, again, to try to uh, add growth factors instead of take them away. Yeah, that's very comprehensive. Thank you, Jason. Um, let me go ahead and and kind of put you on the spot a little bit here. So, if you look at the uh, at some of the subreddits regarding uh, regenerative medicine and PRP and stem cells, a lot of people have questions about what is there evidence for, and you know, hey, I've tried this or I haven't tried this, and surgery was recommended, and is this really what I need? So, let me go ahead. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question that came from the subreddit from a, a patient who said, "I'm debating on whether to have PRP injections into my hip. I had an MRI that showed I had a labral tear of the hip, and it was suggested that I get arthroscopic surgery or scope of the hip. The internet does not seem to offer many customer reviews or outcomes. How many injections do I need? How often? And what else do I need to know about this?" Yeah, so that you know, that's a common question that that we'll get in the office, right? And and the answer is, um, you know, we don't know uh, when you look at the questions like how many injections, how often. That is really, you know, everybody's got their own little recipe. And um, uh, in general, you know, when we're looking at something like PRP, uh, most practitioners will say, well, I want to wait at least six months, or excuse me, six weeks. Um, if it's a bone marrow injection, then, you know, you might be looking at six months uh, before you repeat it. I typically recommend to patients, you know, there's no point in repeating something if you're doing well. Um, and I will have them wait until they start to become symptomatic again. Um, and I might do uh, something where, you know, if I do a PRP injection, for instance, and six weeks later, their pain is starting to return, instead of repeating PRP, I might uh, bolster it with some prolotherapy. So you can certainly mix and match as you go. Now, as far as looking at like a hip labral tear, um, you know, again, if, if you look at the literature, uh, there's lots of studies on arthroscopy for labral tears. Um, you know, some of them are good. Some of them are kind of wishy-washy. Um, and so, you know, obviously there's going to be people in your audience who uh, will be opinionated on whether uh, arthroscopic surgery for labral tears in the hips uh, is a great thing or not so great thing. But overall, it has uh, lots of evidence to support it um, as at least, uh, you know, something that, uh, that patients should consider for this problem. Um, however, when you look at uh, PRP or even bone marrow injections, um, you know, for that problem, there really isn't a whole lot of literature. And so what I tell my patients who come in and, and they're hoping to avoid a surgery, for instance, for this type of problem, uh, is that it, there isn't a lot of science. And, um, you know, if they want to try it, you know, it's certainly reasonable to try. Uh, I mean, the thing to keep in mind is, uh, you know, the, these these procedures are generally safe. I mean, obviously every injection has a risk of uh, injury and, and bleeding and infection and those types of things, whether it's, you know, PRP or a steroid injection, those risks are there. Um, but by and large, if they're done appropriately, those risks are very low. Um, and so it really becomes, you know, kind of up to the patient to decide uh, is the expenditure of money uh, worth it to them? Is it something they're, willing to try knowing that there isn't uh, literature to say that it's a, that they're going to necessarily have a predictable, robust response to those procedures. And they have to accept that if it, you know, if it doesn't work, uh, that they knew that going in. So oftentimes when I'm counseling my patients, uh, that, you know, you can see them get deflated. You know, they come in hoping that, oh my gosh, your stem cells are great and you're going to cure me. And then I kind of tell them something like that where, you know, hey, I don't know if it's going to help you or not. There are certainly people who um, have had good outcomes with labral tears, but I can't tell you that there's really specific data that I can point to that says, you know, 80% of the time it works or, or whatever the, the actual number might end up being uh, as, as uh, these studies do get done. 
Um, but, you know, again, if they're willing to try it, uh, you know, I'm certainly willing to offer it, but I just want to make sure that I'm not over promising. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think risk tolerance becomes a big part of the equation because people are naturally looking for options that reduce their risk. And I think the labral question is really kind of a tough one. We've had people come back in after labral treatments in our practice who, you know, they clearly have better function, they clearly have reduced pain. Uh, now, when they say, look, does that mean my labrum's regrown? I tell them, well, I have no idea, to be honest with you. And frankly, I don't know of a study in the literature that shows, well, we treated a labrum with BMAC and then you know, we came back for second look arthroscopy and the labrum was healed. I, I don't have any studies to show that. All I can tell them is you know, what evidence is out there and, and most of it for the labrum is sparse, at least when it comes to biologics. Um, and kind of what to expect going forward. Let me let me shift gears. There's a couple other really popular questions on the subreddits that we found, and, and a big uh, topic is about meniscus. So this is a question that said, does anyone know if a meniscus can regrow after getting meniscus surgery from PRP or stem cell therapy? Recently, I got a second tear on the same side, and I'm afraid of doing another surgery or removing even more of the meniscus that's there. Yeah, so I, I mean, I guess, you know, again, there's definitely not any studies that have, uh, I mean, number one, uh, there's not much as far as research even looking at doing uh, regenerative treatments for meniscal tears, uh, period. Uh, but if now you're talking about someone who's had a meniscectomy surgery and they're wanting to regrow the part that was taken back, uh, my I guess my gut would say probably not going to happen. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it, it's same as, as what we were talking about before. If people are considering these treatments, it really should be the emphasis on um, improving pain, improving function, as opposed to are we changing the x-rays or are we changing the MRI scans? Now, obviously, in the case of a meniscectomy, there's a benefit. If we could regrow that uh, lost tissue, uh, then, then the likely benefit there would be that that person would be less likely to develop uh, what we would call post-traumatic or, or post-surgical arthritis and hopefully lessen their need for a knee replacement in the future. Um, and so when you look at meniscus injuries, you know, there, there's part of the meniscus that's called uh, the red the red part, and then there's the white part. The white part doesn't really have a great blood supply. Uh, and those are ones that don't heal well, even if you do a stem cell procedure. Uh, whereas the red part, it has a good blood supply. And, and that's a part where, um, you know, if you do these procedures, yeah, you might get some regrowth there. I suppose it's possible. But again, I don't know of any literature that uh, says that that's a predictable outcome. Uh, you know, with a lot of these questions, you know, when you go to conferences, uh, you'll see presenters who will, you know, again, show case reports where they had an individual where they did a treatment and they happened to get an MRI later and the MRI looked better. So we know that these things happen. Uh, we just don't know how often or predictably they happen. Sure. And Jason, let me ask you another thing. Do you ever have somebody come into your office and they are super convinced that it's a meniscus tear that's causing all of their pain and you examine them and you take their history or maybe you do a diagnostic ultrasound in the clinic with them and then you feel like maybe the torn meniscus is not really the problem in the first place? And if that's the case, you know, how, how do you address it? Yeah, you know, I think uh, there is an over-reliance, not, not just on non-physicians, but even in some case physicians to uh, really look at MRI reports and, and to have MRI reports, you know, if there's something on there to kind of say, well, that, that must be the, the pathology. Um, and the reality is, is, you know, as, as we all age, we all get meniscal tears, uh, we all get labral tears, you know, all, we all get degenerative uh, changes in our joints. And so, um, those things happen in people who don't have any symptoms. So those findings aren't always symptomatic. Um, and so part of the process, in my opinion, and I think most people's opinion of being a good regenerative orthopedic uh, medicine practitioner um, is to really fine tune your diagnoses. And so you have to have uh, really good examination skills, really trying to figure out what, uh, what is all going on in that person's knee? Because even if there is a meniscal tear that's pathologic uh, or causing pain, um, the question is, well, why did that person get a meniscal tear? 
Um, and is there some ligamentous instability? Um, you know, do I have to treat the ligaments uh, as opposed to just treating the meniscus? Uh, because oftentimes patients will go and, and get, uh, uh, you know, again, amniotic injections or even PRP injections, and they'll just get an injection into the joint, you know, so this stuff is just floating around in the joint space. Um, and there's really no comprehensive treatment where the ligaments have been addressed um, or what I've actually started doing a lot more in my practice. Um, and I'm, I'm hearing more and more people talk about at conferences is also including uh, nerve injections and um, uh, really doing a comprehensive treatment for the joint in my experience anyway, um, has really helped much more than just doing an intraarticular injection. So I routinely, uh, even if I think, even if I think the pathology or the pain generator is a meniscus or whatever it is, um, I'll routinely treat the entire joint, all of the ligaments, and really goes back to the basics, right? Of uh, If you think about a prolotherapy protocol and how prolotherapy has been practiced for decades and decades, um, it's not just about, you know, putting sugar in your injectate and uh, putting it in the joint. It's really a comprehensive um, uh, treatment that, um, uh, you know, this chapter in my book reviews it somewhat. It's There's a... a, a a concept called biotensegrity. And basically that means uh, that our entire skeletal system uh, is, is made up of bones, but then there's ligaments and tendons that um, keep it all together and moving properly. Um, and if any of those things is, is uh, lax, that uh, it alters the mechanics and the motion of all of the, the uh, interconnecting parts. And so uh, you can't just look at one piece and say, well, that's that's the broken piece. I got to fix it. You really have to understand why did that piece fail? That sounds like a much more biomechanical type of approach than, you know, simply looking at an MRI report and saying, oh, broken part here, stick needle here and inject. Exactly. Yes. So um, let, let's do one more question off the subreddit and then uh, we'll summarize and see if there's anything else you want to add. Um, a popular topic that is also floating around is ACL. And so sometimes we distinguish between partial and full tear ACLs. And there is a reader that had a question and said, uh, I have a, a ACL tear that's one month old and the space between my two ends are four millimeters. Can stem cells actually reattach a completely torn ACL? Um, and so again, this is this is going to be a condition where uh, anecdotally uh, there are folks that you know will show you pictures of treatments they've done where this has happened. Um, what we can't say is is uh, how predictable it is. Um, and again, this is another condition ACL tears where um, you know the surgery to repair an ACL is is a pretty it's a pretty good one as far as surgeries go. Um, and it also depends on what, what the person's needs are. Obviously, if somebody's a competitive athlete and they need to predictably get better within a certain amount of time, then those are folks that they may just consider surgery uh, to fix it, and they might consider something like uh, regenerative uh, treatments to um, add on to that to try to make sure that it heals better. Again, this is all kind of uh, individual recipe as opposed to uh, you know, clear science to back it up, but those are all reasonable things to consider. Um, but, you know, when you look at an ACL, uh, the other issue is, 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 uh, are you going to get the medication or uh, I should say the biologics to the right place? And so again, if you're just putting a needle in the joint space, injecting whether, whether it's PRP or bone marrow into that joint space and hoping that stuff's going to float around and find its way to, uh, the torn ACL and reconnect it, you know, it, it, it's much lower than if you're doing a image guided uh, injection where you know you're getting a needle into the bundle um, uh, for the ACL, making sure that you're getting your cells or your PRP um, actually into the sheath where that uh, tendon needs to regrow. Um, I think conceptually, you, you know, there's, there's a good argument that that is going to increase your likelihood of it being beneficial. That's an excellent summary. So Jason, I'm, I'm walking into your clinic and uh, I've got a partial ACL tear and uh, I'm 25 uh, and I'm, I'm, I understand the risks. Are you going to, are you going to talk to me about biologics or no? Well, yeah, certainly uh, I'll talk to folks about it. Absolutely. Uh, but just with the caveat that, um, you know, my, my big thing is I want to make sure that people's expectations are realistic and, <laughs> 
I, I certainly disagree with the notion of, uh, you know, some of the advertising that goes on out there that basically makes it sound like, oh, these, you know, stem cells are absolutely proven and they work and they're wonderful. Um, and we're going to do this uh, and, and you're going to be good as new um, because the reality is, is, is we're not there yet. And, um, and so people have to understand that. Um, so these procedures are certainly things that, that people can consider. Um, and if they have, you know, the three to $5,000, whatever the expense is, uh, to try them because, you know, for whatever reason they want to uh, potentially avoid a surgery, um, then I, I think it's reasonable to do. But when you think about the informed consent process, um, it's not just about, you know, talking to patients about, uh, uh, you know, the risks of infections and DVT and, uh, you know, those types of things, but also informing them of alternative treatments. And, you know, here's what the uh, you know, kind of standard of care, what your insurance will pay for, uh, what other treatments are out there that's been going on for years and years. Um, and you can certainly talk about the science of those because frankly, um, you know, there's a lot of orthopedic surgeries that, you know, they don't have better than level three evidence either. Um, and yet for some reason we, uh, you know, that we're okay with uh, recommending surgeries to people all day long. Uh, but when you look at regenerative treatments, you know, a lot of the naysayers will say, well, that, that's a bunch of pseudoscience. Uh, you know, there's only level three evidence at best. Um, and so there seems to be a double standard when comparing surgeries versus uh, regenerative treatments um, as far as the level of evidence goes. But I think, you know, as long as we're having those frank discussions with people that says, um, you know, obviously you, you've already looked at the surgery on, on how to the uh, repair an ACL from that standpoint. Now you're in my office talking to me about an alternative. Um, you know, I'm willing to talk about it, but uh, obviously they need to know that if they don't get better, that um, uh, you know the surgery is certainly reasonable. I just want to say, I you know, I really appreciate the sort of the ethical consideration of that of being committed to talking to a patient about their alternatives as well. And I think it's on us who are sort of trying to lead the field and trying to get enough data for what we're doing and to advise people on treatments that are going to help them accomplish their goals based on their values, that that's something we all have to be very much committed to. So I, I want to thank you and encourage you for that. Uh, Jason, anything else that you feel like as a message from your book, A Buyer's Guide to Stem Cell Therapy, which can be found on amazon.com? Anything else that you think is is a crucial part of your message that you would like to pass on to watchers or listeners today? Well, I think, uh, you know, the only thing I would add is, is just really, you know, what we're looking at in the future. And, uh, you know, obviously right now, um, you know, we haven't done a great job in, in solidifying the science of, of the procedures that we have, like PRP and, and bone marrow and, um, you know, amniotic placental tissues, that kind of thing. Um, but what we what we seem to have happening is there's even more products coming on the market. And so, uh, you know, patients are going to be bombarded with, uh, uh, you know, exosomes and lipogems and alpha-2 macroglobulin, um, allogenic stem cells, all of these uh, products that uh, different companies are, are trying to, um, you know, get, get their foothold, if you will, in the market. Um, and so just be aware that, you know, there's, there's all sorts of, of products that are coming out. Uh, it seems like every year there's, there's some new uh, genre, if you will. And um, unfortunately, none of them have uh, really you know, robust science yet. So, um, you know, just make sure you're asking plenty of questions. Uh, do your research. There's uh, certainly no need to uh, rush into any of these treatments, um, you know, especially if there's a high price tag for them. That's outstanding. Jason, thank you so much for your time being on our show today and for your listeners out there, for your potential patients who want to look you up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, you are at Medoma Wellness is your clinic. So modoma.com or at jasonmarchettimd.com, correct? That's it. Yep. Great. Great. And of course, if you have other questions or want more information, um, Jason's book is available on the Amazon uh, Kindle Marketplace, A Buyer's Guide to Stem Cell Therapy, Thank you so much for joining our show today. Again, I'm your host, Dr. Trevor Turner, RMSK at the Center for Regenerative Orthopedics at Georgia Bone and Joint. 
You can check us out online or check us out on Facebook or follow us on YouTube or our blog. Thanks for your time.